Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for February 9th. 2024. And today I've got the first of a new series going through the anti-federalist essays, the letters from a federal farmer. It was November 8th, 1787, when the New York Journal started to advertise a new pamphlet with this title, Observations Leading to a Fair Examination of the System of Government Proposed by the Late Convention and to Several Essential and Necessary Alterations in It in a Number of Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican. And this first series published included the first of these essays, these letters from the Federal Farmer out of 18 total. I'm going to go through some of them. I'll combine into single episodes, but I'm going to go through these essays throughout this series. Uh, those essays were published in 1787 and 1788. But let's go to Jason Mandrish over at Founder of the Day. For those of you who've uh, listened to or watched my other anti-federalist essays on Brutus and Cato and Patrick Henry speeches, you know that I often uh, look to his uh, short blog posts with great insight. Here's how he put it. Generally referred to as observations of the, of the federal farmer. We also hear letters from a federal farmer. This pamphlet is often considered one of the most high-quality anti-federalist papers. It was pretty formidable, very widely read. It includes a series of letters which conclude that the U.S. Constitution was assembled too hastily and leaves the nation vulner vulnerable to an assumption of power and inevitable tyranny. It's really about consolidation or centralization of power. And I did an episode last fall, August of 2023, anti-federalist top warnings from the federal farmer when I went through kind of a series of the leading arguments that the author made throughout these essays. And he basically repeatedly warned us about the dangers of consolidation of centralized power. And he predict predicted that the proposed government would end in the destruction of freedom. That's a quote, the destruction of freedom. This will be linked to plus all the original source documents and uh, other links uh, will be over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. We'll get a blog post published on this episode like we do every episode a couple hours after the live stream is done here today. So today I've got highlights from his first paper. Now, first of all, I should point out that over at the Lee Family Archive, they write that for nearly two centuries, the federal farmer was thought to be Richard Henry Lee. You find this all over the place. When you find publications uh, online of the federal farmer, they're often associated with Richard Henry Lee. And here at the Lee Family Archive, they know, well, Listen to this. He's one of the staunchest anti-federalists of Virginia. Now, Lee was in New York where they were published at the time, serving as a member of Virginia's delegation to the Confederation Congress and could have taken part in the writing or printing of the pamphlets. But they recognized that starting in the 1970s, it was pretty much almost proven. You can't 100 percent prove it but almost proven that it wasn't Richard Henry Lee. And it was really Gordon S. Wood who did, uh, who kind of led the research on that. If you want to read his research, it's called The Authorship of the Letters from the Federal Farmer. We know almost certainly it was not Richard Henry Lee. He could have had some influence in it, and it was very likely someone like Melanchthon Smith. We know that when the letters were sent to the Republican, they were probably addressing New York Governor George Clinton, the other one. But anyways, let's get back to the, the thrust of the argument here. And Jason Mandras puts it this way. The federal farmer's first observation begins as most anti-federalist papers do, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. And then he asks why the decision to ratify is being pushed for a quick resolution. And here's how the federal farmer put it. He said, it must be granted that if men hastily and blindly adopt the system of government, they will as hastily and as blindly be led to alter or abolish it. Of course, using terms that everyone at the time and everyone today should be familiar with, alter or abolish. You don't want a system where you're always having to go through an overthrow because that leads to some kind of chaos is what federal farmers warning. So if you rush into a system without thinking about it, you're always going to have to continually alter or abolish, and then changes must ensue one after another till the peaceable and better part of the community, community will grow weary with changes, tumults, and disorders, and be disposed to accept any government, however despotic, that shall promise stability 
and firmness. It sounds kind of familiar to a little bit of what we live under today, although the alter or abolish is done by, well, executive fiat or one of the branches just changing the meanings of words in the Constitution and then the people going along with it. Now, this is very similar. This kind of kickoff from the federal farmers is very similar to some of the other arguments made by other anti-federalists, prominently Cato in his first anti-federalist paper. And Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, responded to this, most likely Hamilton, writing as Caesar, basically that threatened the states. Okay, because the argument here from Cato and federal farmers, is we don't have to rush into this. Let's take our time looking at this. And maybe we need to propose some alterations. And Hamilton was concerned about this, so he threatened them. He said in uh, uh, two papers that basically you're going to accept it as is, no amendments, no recommendation, or you're going to get it anyway with a military dictator. So this was a really aggressive push. And the message from some of the Federalists, many of them early on, some of them changed their tune because the, the opposition to their approach was pretty aggressive. But the message from some of the Federalists was basically that there was a crisis, an emergency. They had to take action. They had to do something. Congress was powerless. They couldn't collect taxes. There was massive debt, paper money all over the place. There's a rebellion in Massachusetts, and a new system was needed immediately. And here's how the federal farmer responded. He said, it is natural for men who wish to hasten the hate. Let me start that over. It's natural for men who wish to hasten the adoption of a measure to tell us now is the crisis, now is the critical moment which must be seized, or all will be lost, and to shut the door against free inquiry whenever conscious the thing presented has defects in it, which time and investigation will probably discover. Just like what we've seen in recent years, recent decades, really all through my life, there's always one crisis or another that they have to act on immediately. And if you oppose things on constitutional grounds, you want to say, hey, slow it down. They say, well, it's an emergency. If we don't do this now, things are going to be much worse. And Federal Farmer warned about that in 1787. He pointed out that this has been the custom of tyrants and their dependents in all ages. Fear, of course, is the foundation of all kinds of government power. So, you know, then he threw a little bit of shade. He was started suggesting that there might be some bad motives. And Jason Manders points out that he noted that at the Annapolis Convention, something that I should cover here on an episode at some point in September of 1786, they met and adjourned before all the delegates could even arrive. And they had a call for a general convention in 1787. That's the convention, the Philadelphia Convention. So there was a meeting in Annapolis in 1786. Not everyone made it there. And then before everyone showed up, they called for what became the Philadelphia Convention. He said they hastily proposed a convention to be held in May 1787. But get this, for the purpose generally of amending the Confederation. This was done before the delegates of Massachusetts and of the other states arrived. Still not a word was said about destroying the old Constitution and making a new one. So he's saying, well, I thought we were sold on the idea that they were just going to amend the system. And now we're being given a brand new one. He said the states still unsuspecting and not aware that they were passing the Rubicon appointed members to the new convention for the sole and express purpose of revising and amending the Confederation. And probably not one man in 10,000 in the United States till within these 10 or 12 days had an idea that the old ship was to be destroyed. And he put to the alternative of embarking in the new ship presented or of being left in danger sinking. So if you think about the date of this, I believe the first one he wrote was October 8th, 1787. The Philadelphia Convention was done on September 17th. Then they sent the document to the Confederation Congress. They had some debates there. Richard Henry Lee certainly tried to get a Bill of Rights attached to it before it was sent to the states, but they ended up sending it without that. And then finally, you got a couple of weeks where people are considering it. And I think a lot of people were taken aback. I thought we were just getting amendments. And now look at this whole brand new system. And the federal farmers kind of suggesting maybe there were some bad motives behind this. Going further, he said, the non-attendance of eight or nine men who were appointed members of the convention, I shall ever consider as a very unfortunate event to the United States. If you think about it, Patrick Henry, of course, we know the kind of fam- famous statement that he possibly said of, I smell a rat. 
He wasn't. Uh, he decided he did not want to go there. There was only one person who got more votes to be at the convention in Virginia than Patrick Henry, and that was George Washington. So he was incredibly famous at the time, had a lot of support. And this is probably one of the people being hinted at here, the non-attendance of eight or nine men. He's saying, well, maybe they could have changed the course of this. He said, had they attended, I am pretty clear that the result of the convention would not have had that strong tendency to aristocracy now discernible in every part of the plan. There would not have been so great an accumulation of powers, especially as to the internal police of the country, in a few hands, as the Constitution reported proposes to vest in them. So he's saying there were a handful of people that might have slowed this thing down and given us a different approach. Now, he wasn't totally against he wasn't totally against having uh, amendments or a change to the system. He just thought that, well, the way that they're going about this and maybe what they came up with isn't going to accomplish what we're being sold on. Now, his biggest concern was that the system was going to lead towards consolidation or centralization of power but he did agree that the articles of confederation he was not one of these guys that wanted to keep the articles so many people today who say the anti-federalists were right we hear this all the time the anti-federalists were right but there was a wide range of thought federal farmer was one of the most widely read ones and did not agree with keeping the articles of confederation and here from tara ross someone else who i cite very often on these anti-federalists episodes she writes that in this paper the federal farmer agreed that the old system was problematic particularly when it came to matters of trade and commerce. And one of the things that he cited a few times, even in just in his first paper, was paper money in the state. So he wasn't a fan of depreciating fiat funny money. Quote, a federal government of some sort is necessary, he acknowledged. And she continues. This again from TaraRoss.com. The federal farmer has one big concern. He believes the Constitution will ultimately consolidate the 13 states into one whole. And this is how the farmer put it. The plan of government now proposed is evidently calculated totally to change in time our condition as a people. Instead of being 13 republics under a federal head, it is clearly designed to make us one consolidated government. And as Patrick Henry warned and so many others, and on the Federalist side too, people like Fisher Ames, who was a big, big government nationalist from Massachusetts, he said, there, Fisher Ames said, there can't be too much provision against consolidation. And the way that Federal Farmer and some of the other anti-Federalists were looking at things, that even if they could be convinced that the way that it was structured was to prevent that, they thought that they were a little loose in some of the terms, and over time it would progress that way. And that's really the argument that Federal Farmer is leaning on here. But back to his essay, he said, This consolidation of the states has been the object of several men in this country for some time past. And he knows because he watched how things played out. Now, let's say it's Melanchthon Smith. He watched how this played out firsthand, and they made it very difficult to consolidate power under the Articles of Confederation. But he noticed that, uh, and he even talked about this in the, in the essay, that right off the bat, they tried centralizing power, but they couldn't get stuff passed. That led to the Annapolis Convention, and then, of course the proposals that came out of Philadelphia. He said, whether such a change can ever be affected in any manner, whether it can be affected without convulsions and civil wars, whether such a change will not totally destroy the liberties of this country, time only can determine. So he's suggesting that if you try to centralize power, you're going to end up with all kinds of stuff, maybe a civil war, and it'll destroy liberty completely. Patrick Henry in Virginia the following year, he certainly said consolidation must end in the destruction of our liberties. And this was a leading argument from the anti-federalist. Federal Farmer was very eloquent on this. But he, says, he keeps suggesting that, well, this might have been part of the plan. I think some on the federalist side certainly weren't trying to be scammers, but some others there, Alexander Hamilton and a few others, probably had some kind of underhanded motive. And then they, so especially Hamilton, of course, he sold uh, the document in the New York ratifying convention as one of expressly delegated powers. But soon as things went into effect, 
that became, well, just forgotten. And then, of course, he flip-flopped on war powers, on implied powers, all kinds of stuff. So Federal Farmer was recognizing that there were some people who were selling it as one thing, but probably wanting to manipulate it over time as something else. And he says the plan proposed appears to be partly federal, but principally, however, calculated ultimately to make the states one consolidated government. So calculated. This was intentional to federal farmer. He said the first interesting question, therefore, suggested is how far the states can be consolidated into one entire government on free principles. And he suggested that there were really only three options going forward. Either they were going to stay with the system as is or they were going to make changes. And so the first option, he said, was distinct republics connected under a federal head. In this case, the respective state governments must be the principles, principal guardians of the people's rights and exclusively regulate their internal police. In them must rest the balance of government. This is much more similar to what was under the Articles of Confederation. So option one was basically kind of keep things the same. The states were kind of the leading role. It was, uh, you know, just a very distinct federal system, system of federalism. He said the Congress of the states or federal head must consist of delegates amenable to and removable by the respective states, because that also asserts that they are in charge. If they are just representing the states, the state should be able to withdraw them or recall them at any point. Two, he said, we may do, oh, he points out that under this federal version of government, the powers of Congress would be rather advisory or recommended, recommendatory, basically just recommendations and not coercive is how he put it. That's option one. Option two, he said, we may do away with the several state governments and form or consolidate all the states into one entire government with one executive, one judiciary, and one legislature, consisting of senators and representatives collected from all parts of the union. In this case, there would be a complete consolidation of the states. Now, James Madison proposed something not even this aggressive uh, in what was known as the Virginia Plan early on in the Philadelphia Convention. We know throughout the convention uh, that Alexander Hamilton pushed for a total consolidation. I've got an episode talking about Hamilton's absolute worst plan. So certainly this was one of the options on the table. And you might be surprised at what Federal Farmer has to say about that in just a moment. But number three is we may consolidate the states as to certain national objects and leave them severally distinct independent republics as to internal police generally. Let the general government consist of an executive, a judiciary, balanced legislature, powers generally on uh, foreign concerns, and everything else is reserved to the states. It's very similar to what James Madison described as the structure of the proposed constitution in Federalist 45. He said the powers delegated by the proposed constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those reserved to the states are numerous and indefinite. That's basically option number three. And he saw the last one as a partial consolidation because some of it was going to be nationally dictated, but everything else was going to be reserved to the states. That was the one that he favored, and that's how he put it. The third plan, or partial consolidation, is in my opinion the only one that can secure the freedom and happiness of this people. So Federal Farmer, one of the leading anti-federalists, was not in favor of keeping the Articles of Confederation. He also was not in favor of the Virginia plan, the Madisonian original plan, or the Hamilton approach, but he wanted this kind of mixture of partly national, partly federal. That's what we were told that we were getting, and he's going to examine that further to see if it actually fits that description throughout the rest of his essays. But get this, I once had some general ideas that the second plan was practicable, so he really was on board with plan number two. So some people will tell us like, oh, these were just bad people. They only wanted to consolidate power. Maybe you can say that about Hamilton. But some of them really believe that the way to preserve liberty was, well, of course, they lived under the unlimited power of a king in parliament. This is what they were used to. So it shouldn't be surprising that many of them kind of tended towards thinking that that might be just you just need a, a different version of it run by the right people. We shouldn't be too surprised that that kind of thing still existed. And one of the leading anti-federalists, his first thought was, I wanted a complete consolidation, get rid of the states completely and just have it be one national system 
dictating everything. He said, I had once had some general ideas that the second plan was practicable, but from long attention and the proceedings of the convention, I am fully satisfied that this third plan is the only one we can with safety and propriety proceed upon. Sounds like he was in Philadelphia, doesn't it? Melanchthon Smith, possibly. He said the convention appears to have proposed the partial consolidation, evidently with a view to collect all powers ultimately in the United States into one entire government. So he's basically saying, you know, the third plan is the way to go. And it might look like they've given us the third plan, but I think over time, it's not going to be plan three. It's going to turn into plan two. And I'm not on board with that at all. And he sums up this first paper with this. He said, before we do away the state governments or adopt measures that will tend to abolish them and to consolidate the states into one entire government, several principles should be considered and facts ascertained. These and my examination into the essential parts of the proposed plan, I shall pursue in my next. So we will cover more of these in the coming weeks and months, but I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational, more important than anything. I hope it made you think, and I hope you learned something. If you want to help us spread this kind of message out and get this kind of history out to more and more people, nothing helps us do this kind of work more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month. We're talking about paper money and fiat and depreciating currency. But if you got a couple of bucks of that dirty government fiat, throw it our way over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. Our membership program start out, starts out at just two bucks a month. There's also annual five-year and lifetime options. I appreciate any consideration you can give to joining us today. Again, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you have an awesome weekend and hope to see you next week here on The Path to Liberty.